Hey guys, welcome to my YouTube channel. This is a new series, not new anymore, right? It's, it's a series already that we're doing on this YouTube channel where I interview or talk to, have conversations with leading tech African entrepreneurs. I've done interviews with Oyinka from Farm Crowdy, Nadia Eden, Ezra um, Paystack, and a couple of others. And today we're going to be talking with Yinka Diwali, the co-founder and CEO of Kodi. Hi, Yinka. Hi, Pius. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm really glad to have you here. Thanks for having me. Because you're almost nowhere on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> so having you here is like, yay, <laughs> I've tried. So I'm looking forward to the conversation. Are you? Yeah, I am. Yeah, okay. thank you. Welcome to my YouTube channel. I'm PC Timmy, a change maker, professional, and creative who is passionate about growing people and growing businesses. Like, comment, subscribe to my channel, and please always share my videos. It promises to always be impactful and insightful. So let's get to the video. We're having a conversation with Yinka, CEO of Kudi. Okay, introduction over. Yes. Wow, that's, that's a lot of work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so I want to start with you, okay. right? Because I don't feel like I know I, I know anything about you except what's on your LinkedIn. So tell me about like growing up. Where did you grow up? How was it like? Do you have siblings? Just just me, like as much as you can say. Okay, so. Um, I come from a family of four boys. All boys? Yes, and I'm the last child. Oh. Um, I grew up in Abiokuta Ogun State. Um, uh, what else is important? Uh, so my childhood was really, um, was quite interesting because I remember at a, quite a, an early age of, I think like 12, I started writing code. Which would be weird because I, where I grew up wasn't, um, it wasn't like there were computers or right. it was like random. I, I remember that. So my secondary school at the time, I just got in this new set of computers and there was this science teacher that wanted to basically show all of us how basic as a programming language worked. And so typically you will be in like, a batch of like 10 people and there will be someone that is supposed to type the code for everyone <laughs> so interestingly i was you know always like the lucky one to, to type it and at the time um one of my older brothers or my eldest brother um had like some sort of pyramid scheme that was going on basically <laughs> which is you invite a couple of people to a program you get like a keyboard then you do a bunch of stuff, you get a mouse. Oh. And eventually, <laughs> it's going to build up to a computer. So, uh, sadly, you only got the keyboard. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I had the keyboard at home, but I didn't have a, a computer. So, essentially, even the reason why I was the one for my class was because I, I, I was already... The keyboard yeah, is. I, I knew how to type uh, and stuff. So, I did that for, you know, a couple of years. And then I just decided that I wanted to learn, like, web design, um, PHP and a bunch of like other programming language to do stuff and I was just in a community where there was someone around that had been building like websites forever and my one of my childhood friends we typically would go to this person's house and then he would show us how to build websites so um, I would say by the time I was getting into the university for example mm -hmm. I could actually build like a functioning like web application wow. and I just but for some reason I think maybe it was arrogance or <laughs> whatnot I didn't want to study computer science I wanted to do like mechanical engineering because I felt that um, I was going to then take my knowledge of computing and then put it into hardware and stuff so I studied mechanical engineering at Obafemi Aola University yeah that's that's a and so bit when you left background. though you ended up going to web development right that was like your first job if i'm correct my first job um from after the university yeah, right after uni. so no i i took um so in my second year in school um i i got a job at a company which ended up firing me <laughs> <laughs> oh my god i'm coming back to that story yeah but it was it was um I started as like a web um, web developer there, but then I, we're also doing some like machine learning on um, sort of trying to predict traffic and some stuff like that in Lagos. It was quite interesting at the time. Um, and then I had like a 
commu if I had a community of like software engineers back then, so typically we'd live together and all that. And I just wanted to, to you know, do something cool. So they were paying me like maybe like ten k a month. Or so. But it was, <laughs> it was like good money, it was good money actually. It was really good money. Yeah. So, so yeah, that that was like my first real gig and mm -hmm. stuff. Um, and eventually, uh, in my 14th school, which is probably like my only real job so far, mm. um, I took another internship at um, Venture Garden Group. Right, entrepreneurial yeah. residence. Yeah, which which probably is one of the most impactful mm. um, thing in my life. Why, why do you say it's the most impactful? Because um, at the time when I got into the company, um, they wanted to do this. Um, they were going to start a company within a company right mm. so the project i was working on was some foil um technology business whereby we were supposed to build prepaid cards as loyalty cards for companies uh we're supposed to build like an e-commerce platform that allowed businesses make orders for diesel and stuff right. so i ended up spending like nine months my first week um i think i spent it in like w working on legal documents so mm. And so thinking about someone that comes from like a, I was doing mechanical engineering in school, I was writing code, and then my first week was spent like reading MOUs and NDAs. And then the next week, I think I was working with some guy in finance, looking at financial models and stuff. So during that nine months, while I still had the, my full-time job there was to write code and build, you know, like websites and web applications mm. or mobile applications rather. I had like a very wide understanding of how a business worked. And then Bumia as the CEO was quite, Bumi was very approachable. So I, I remember I was living with my dad somewhere far on the mainland. And then every Sunday, almost every Sunday, myself and one of my friends would drive from Iyanopaja to Leki ah. in Bumi's house. <laughs> then, and then I would be in Bumi study and then I would be there sort of like and I was an intern, right? This company probably had over 200 employees when I was there. Mm. So I was like, it wasn't like I was anything fantastic and all of that, but I would be in Bumi's house. And that basically sh shaped me because then when we were done with maybe like the planning for the week, and then Bumi would probably take us downstairs and some of his CEO friends would come. And then I'm just pitching them like my <laughs> new ideas that, oh, I'm, <laughs> I'm doing something and stuff. So, yeah, that was a really good experience for me. Yeah, but I saw on your LinkedIn, after doing the EIR, you went back to software development. But you said that that was the only real job. So was that other company a freelance or what was it? Oh, yeah. So there are a few things that you probably look at my LinkedIn. Um, it probably doesn't give you a full picture of the things I have done. So there are probably a few things that I, I hadn't updated then. So while I was in Adventure Garden Group, um, they had a program called GIB. Okay. Um, it was Garden Institute of Business and Entrepreneurship. And the whole idea was that you were going to take a couple of um, entrepreneurs into a six months program and then they were going to fund them mm. so the whole idea is you 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 build a team and then there was like a lot of mentorship from different ceos uh, it wasn't even just tech so many of the founders that piccolo would come would be ceos of like pharmaceutical companies right. that were like 15 years so there was a, a little bit of like um mentoring there so myself and two of my friends started this company called um, Clinic Bell. So the whole idea was we were going to, um, it was a CRM for hospitals to mm. send like SMS, drug reminders and all of that to patients. So, and we had gotten into this program, started to build out this website and all that. I had a day job at VGG, you know, right. so they were paying me to <laughs> using that sort of like cash to fund like Reason. hosting and SMSs and stuff. But the business model was flawed. So the, we were trying to build it as a subscription business. Mm. So, and the whole idea was that for every hospital that we got, we were going to charge them 10,000 a month to use the service. Mm. And then they would have access to unlimited SMS right. and all that. So, and I remember the day we landed our first hospital, myself and one of my friends had gone there to, you know, pitch this product to the medical um, director of the hospital. I was so excited about it. Enrolled them. I think they had about 60,000 patients. Um, and then we got another hospital. So essentially, we probably had like 180,000 
patient records there. But the challenge was these guys would fire like these SMSs like three times a week. <laughs> and each of these SMSs was costing like one naira or two naira thereabouts. So in our, you know, I would say naivety, right? We felt that, so at the time, there was a SMS gateway that told us that if you paid us a million naira, mm -hmm. we're going to allow you send unlimited SMSs per year. Mm. So the whole idea was build traction, then raise capital to then pay off yeah. this stuff, and then we can, can then sign up as many hospitals as possible. So and it ended up, you know, we couldn't raise capital after like the program, you know, for different reasons. Most likely we didn't. The business didn't look like a business. Yeah. The, the business model was flawed. And then the business shut down. Um, and then that was when I was finishing my, my internship okay. there and I was supposed to go back to school. And then I started another company. Um, it was another health record stuff. Um, but this one was purely, there won't be SMSs. If there was going to be SMSs, the, the hospitals were going to like fund a wallet and then send SMSs from it. But then I went to see someone at Bagada that was trying to pitch this idea to and say, oh, come and you know, invest in this. I need like a millionaire for this SMS gateway yeah. that I'm trying to buy. And then on my way back to, I was staying at a redemption camp at the time because my parents um, had the house there. And I was in this like, I was coming from Bagada to yeah, Moe side. Yeah. I was in this bus. And then I got to this junction and I wanted to take my change from this, you know, this conductor and this guy looks at me and says he doesn't have change <laughs> that was suffering with 500 mile you know those kind of stuff that how, how, how come you entered and then there was an ag bureau on the roadside that he wanted to give i think maybe 200 naira to and then maybe my change was 300 naira and then he gave the ag bureau 500 mm -hmm. and said i should go and sort out the change with <laughs> the ag bureau so <laughs> and that bureau says my ball <laughs> basically like follow me and i was like no this, no, this was a bad it. idea so I think two days later, my where I was staying, uh, my parents' house, the electricity went off, and I reached out to my dad to say, "Oh, how do I fund this stuff?" And he was like, "Oh, there's a card there. Take the card, take it to this location, and then pay them, and they're going to sort it out." And then basically reloaded the card, slot it back into the the, the meter, and then yeah. there was power. And then I was like, "Why couldn't we build like offline payments, mm. right?" So then I went back to school, then started this company called Sunwo. Um, it was a prepaid card payment for students to buy food at restaurants, um, take buses and, and stuff. So I remember that I had reached out to one of my, one of my you know, f really good f childhood friends, but basically co-founded this company together. And then we reached out to one of our lecturers to be like, oh, well, we're trying to build this payment company yeah. and the guy's like oh why not leverage nfc and while i was at venture guiding group actually i did work on some nfc card mm. technology um for fleet drivers and then so i remember we got the first nfc card from you know this computer science professor and then we were basically like just coding against it and then we built this merchant app that allowed you know a store to basically accept payments and my job then was like convince almost all the stores on campus to adopt it as a payment method. So, but the challenge was that, and many people were excited because this was like 2014, POSs were not a, mm. you know, many of these stores at IFE then didn't even have a POS machine. Students had debit cards, but you had to walk to the ATM yeah. and then there would typically be like a long queue and stuff. And eventually we needed to raise capital. <laughs> So LinkedIn. I went to LinkedIn, yes, I went to LinkedIn, and then there was some guy, you know, that reached out to me that I wanted to come to Nigeria to start a company at some point, and then if he came, we're going to, to, um, to connect. So I remember sending him a message, I'm like, oh, I just started this company that's going to change the face of payments in Africa. Like, <laughs> I was like, this was going to be bigger than InterSwitch. <laughs> Yeah, and I was like, okay, like, what's it? Then I pitched him this idea of, you know, payment is largely cash offline, and then we're going to, like, roll out these prepaid cards, and I was going to work offline. And in a few weeks, right, never met this guy, and then we agreed on a $25,000 investment. And then I was in the university, it was my fifth year in school, um, and then basically, like, just rolled it out to, 
I think about maybe like 10 merchants then. Uh, the model was quite expensive because we had to buy like 100 phones that had right. NFC for these guys. And most, m most of these phones were HTC model. It was quite expensive. I think the average phone then was like 50,000 thereabouts. And then, so we had these cards. Um, and we also had like an agent network because it was offline. So yeah. you had to put in cash on the card somehow. So we had like all these airtime sellers as agents, you know, that would hand a commission when you um, load the card. Mm -hmm. And I think at the, you know, height of it, we probably had, um, you know, maybe about 2,000 students that eventually like got the card one way or the other. I still remember vividly there was a time when we're doing like 700,000 Naira in sales every day. And then that we're taking- huge then. Yeah, it was huge. <laughs> like, you, and we're taking a 2% fee on, on processing. But it was quite very disconnected from like the payment ecosystem. Yeah. I remember that every day I would go to the merchant's outlet to pay them out in cash, you know, for oh. all the transactions. It wasn't even, we couldn't make bank transfers then, you know, yeah, it was weird actually. So yeah, so that, that was what I did. And then, so I did that after, literally my fifth year in school and so after school. And I, I worked on the company for another like two years. Oh, and wow. Yes, um, eventually moved to Lagos, um, um, you know, raised the seed round of, I think about $100,000. Um, eventually, probably the team grew to maybe about 10. There so about, what happened? Well, no, well, nothing happened. I, I think that um, we were at the point where um, we're going to decide what the future holds for the, for the business. Mm -hmm. So essentially, I felt that we were, we, while I liked the NFC idea, I felt like the infrastructure was too expensive mm -hmm. and it was going to be difficult to scale because we had like very fragmented products. So we had, you know, payments for schools. We did like ID cards for different schools. We did transport cards and they weren't connected. So they were like oh, fragmented just, yeah. systems. So, and I felt that you know, it could be cool to do something mobile. And then I remembered having a conversation with my friend then, which was my co-founder and, and some of our early investors in the company. And most people just didn't really think that it was right. the way to go. They felt like, you know, because Africa was, or Nigeria generally then, even till now, still like largely driven by cash. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you needed something that was going to work offline. But I felt like the internet was getting a bit better. Yeah. Um, mobile subscriptions were getting cheaper. And, you know, one day I, I resigned. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You resigned from the, but it was your company? Yes, it was my company, yes. So tell me, I'm, I'm curious <laughs> about what the transition was. Did you end up getting acquired? Or you just be like, peace and light, company's down, everybody go back home. No, so I, I think it's, it's one of the, you know, experiences that have shaped my life a lot. Mm -hmm. I've, I don't even think I've ever talked about it anywhere. Um, <laughs> so I think that largely because there were two founders in the company, we were sort of like both co-CEOs, so, okay. um, and we're like childhood friends. So there wasn't, um, it was the kind of company where if a founder left, it could survive. Okay. Um, because like both of us were technical, right. both of us were, were figuring out this business stuff. Yeah. So. There wasn't really like one person was tilted to, mm. to one side. And um, and then I, I remember it was a, the Saturday before, I, myself and my co-founder had sat down with one of our mentors. Um, and then we we're like, oh, you know, we're doing this stuff. And then we also had a bit of, um, what's it called? We weren't really agreeing on like so many things with our early investors. Um, I think it was just perspective, you know. On one end, we were quite young, mm -hmm. well, and they also had probably, not like probably, they were building businesses in financial services. So they pretty much had like, much I would say better experience of the market than we were. So I pretty much would have felt like, you know, these guys were going in the wrong direction. And then it was just this thing of, oh, we're gonna stop them. And because it was like my first shot at raising venture capital, um, we had given up like almost control of the business at the time. Right. So the only way out of it was like, you know, you quit. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I remember having a conversation myself and my co-founder then with one of our mentors and, you know, he told us that like, you know, how old are you? I think I was like 24. So how old are you? Like 25, like, like resign. <laughs> <laughs> And I like, you know, you, you can still do like the other things in your life. I think it was 
2016. Yeah, it was maybe early 2016 thereabouts. Um, so yeah, I think that so eventually myself and my, my co-founder agreed that I was going to leave um, okay. and he was going to keep running the business. And so of course I feel like in hindsight, um, I could have probably managed that process a lot better. <laughs> you know, I think I was a bit, a bit dramatic about my <laughs> exit, um, which eventually, you know, led to like, there was like months of like insane, mm. you know, back and forth, you know, um, I remember my investor once told me that um, she was going to make sure that she destroys my life, something ah. like that. Yeah, it was quite, <laughs> it, she took it quite, 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 quite personal. Yeah. But then like, you know, so I left uh, my, my other co-founder, you know, started to run the business, eventually raised, you know, more venture capital. And I, I think they, you know, I think they, they did well. Eventually, I'm not exactly sure how, you know, the company, is. Are you guys still friends? Yeah, we're still friends, actually. We're Wait, still friends. Are you, are you not sure how the company is? We don't talk about business. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Jody <draw the> lied. <laughs> yes. So, so yeah, that, that was how that, that experience went. So, did they buy you out? Or do you still have equity? Or? Huh. Did they buy me out? No. Um, I, I walked away with nothing. Because the only... So, basically, so I, after I left the company, you know, I had started Kudi. Okay. Uh, or then I started working on Kudi. My servant and colleague had been talking about Kudi for a while. And then there was this chat bot that could allow you by a time. I mean, they don't start talking Kudi yet. Just finish that part oh, of the oh, Okay, so, um, so when I, so the problem is that, it, so essentially, it's right, I had to like trade all my stock in the company okay. for the ability for me to go and run Kudi by myself. You know, it, oh. it was more like, oh, if you're going to do Kudi, you know, we want something there right oh. you know because you're going to be competing with us and i'm like well how does like something that sells hair time on on facebook and a card to buy something is still competes but again it, it didn't matter so what's more like okay i then had to be like well, okay here are all my vested shares you can have three so years of my life of this, yeah. and then you know i'll go build my other business so so essentially that's what happened uh, okay okay so could you so where how did the idea come and how did you and Pelumi decide that, you know what, two of us are doing this together? Also, being that you had already had a co-founder relationship, I feel like this is two questions in one, but you already had a co-founder relationship with a friend. Yeah, and my you best you friend. And you left with your best <laughs> friend. And three years down the line, you're like, peace and light, and you're living with nothing. And now you're starting another company with another friend. Like, how did you, how were you sure that this was going to like play out right now, based on that experience? And then how did the idea start? Okay, so I, I think one of the things that um being young and you know not knowing so much about life does for you allows you just take like big bets mm. one thing that i was sure of was that even if i failed i was 25 thereabouts i would go get a software engineering job somewhere <laughs> bad so bad. yeah and like my friends that were working at conga um or other tech companies then and they were making good money so they were even making money better money than i was making so yeah. so there was a i had a plan b it was like if this startup thing didn't work i'll go and write code but then one evening i was taking a walk um and then i think conga just released this report that said i think there was 160,000 customers there about that had used the service in like six months and I was shocked because I'm like, you know, with all of these hundreds of millions of venture capital that had gone into, you know, this e-commerce business, I felt it was going to be bigger than that. And then I started thinking that um, that meant like this consumer internet business in Nigeria was more difficult than I, than I thought. Mm. And so I started thinking about it that what if it was the way the technology was positioned um, my mom or my dad or my uncles will probably never try to buy something on Conga or Jumia sure. at the time. But then we were always talking on WhatsApp. Mm. So there was only one technology that I knew that almost everybody was using and it was messaging. So um, Pelumi was working at the messaging company in Nexmo at that time. And then we had, we had been friends from school. And he had written some academic papers on um, natural language processing and stuff. And I remember I was just thinking about what if we could build commerce 
fun messaging whereby you could just go to WhatsApp and say, oh, I want to buy something. And then all of that happened. So there was like this rush of an adrenaline in my brain. <laughs> and then I went back to my house, went on Skype and then sent him a message. I'm like, you know, we need to talk. And then he didn't reply. And then next I'm like, oh, we need to talk. It's really urgent. Then I'm like, ah, that who died? Like, nobody <laughs> has died. But so then I pitched him this idea of, you know, this could be really big. Uh, messaging is the future and we just have to get in right now the things are serious yeah. <laughs> and then if you know Kwelumi, okay well Kwelumi is quite different from me he's very i'm like oh let's do like shit ton of things Kwelumi is like mm. so Kwelumi is like okay all, right, all of this commerce stuff i want to build i think it's like too complicated what's if it, what's the basic thing we can do and like we'll sell it time mm. and so we then started to like finding people that could give us like APIs to vend their time. And interestingly at this time, Paystack and Flutterway was also just like they were it wasn't like they had just launched, but it was the time where it was the first time you could tokenize cards right. in Nigeria where you could do like recurring debits on, on cards. So we had integrated Paystack and Flutterway and then we basically just started to like vend at time DSTV go TV subscriptions. At some point we added money transfers to it and Essentially, that, that's how Kudi started. Mm -hmm. And then I, you know, I remember convincing Kweli to leave his job in the UK to come and do this full time. And he did. Well, that, it was a bit of a <laughs> interesting conversation because, so his, his, his mom had signed up on this service. Mm -hmm. And then our firm then, um, the first field was putting your BVN. And so he had told his mom that he was going to quit his job and work on this full time. And I wasn't even really sure whether she was at peace with that decision. But then I think two days later, she went to the ATM machine and then it was the time when banks would typically put, don't give anybody your BVN, don't review your BVN. And then I think it was in the news as well. So his mom just called him and was like, I hope you haven't resigned. <laughs> <laughs> I just so saw in the papers that like, you're not supposed to give your BVN to someone. That like, This stuff that you're building on this BVN thing isn't going to work. But sadly, I think he had resigned. So, and yeah. So <laughs> I hope she's advice came too late, but it, it worked came out too well. Late, yeah, well, we hope so. So that was so the the the, the commerce on chat was Kudi AI, right? Yes. And then you guys have now pivoted to just Kudi, right? So yes. What's what's that? What's the story? Yeah, the transaction. Right? Um. So there are like multiple thing things that led to the the pi pivot. Actually, mm -hmm. I think the first one was um. So we got into YC and. January 2017. So we did YC. Askudi.ai. So we did YC from January to March. And I remember it was investor day. Well, we started full time, um, I think, month five. Month yes, five, it was okay. December, yes. So well, just before YC. Just before YC, yes. Okay. Yes, just before YC. Um, so at, I think at sometime in March um, 2017, we were processing. Fifteen thousand dollars a. I think fifteen thousand dollars. You smile now because that money computer <laughs> you are doing it now cute. is just like. <laughs> <laughs> it was about fifteen thousand dollars a. So it was cute. A, you know, a month in transactions, and you know, we're pitching to almost like all the big investors in Silicon Valley, and everybody was just like, nah, because prior a year before us was Flutterwave, and Flutterwave was, was processing twenty million dollars a month, or at process twenty million dollars you know, historically as at that time. time. So when you showed up and you, you, know, you dangled this $15,000 processing, you're like, what's this? But then like, at lunch time, a certain, you know, aged man walk, walked up to me and he was like, oh, you are the Kudi founders. And then I was like, yes. And he was like, oh, that, you know, he's an early investor in Square. Mm. And he had been trying to convince like, you know the team to build something on messaging but i you know it thinks that messaging is cute um but that you need to actually especially for if you're building for like emerging markets like mm. nigeria that you need to actually focus on a demography of people that don't even use financial services at all mm. and that if you're keen to talk you know here's my card you know you can shoot me an email then i looked at the card it said said vinod kosla you know i didn't know who it was and then I Googled it and I realized that it was a billionaire in dollars. So I was uh -uh. like, okay, <laughs> my <laughs> village make, people. <laughs> call. So then I found out that it was, you know, it was the founder of some microsystems and the 
uh, you know, general partner at Kuzla Ventures. And then I shot, you know, Vinod an email and we scheduled like a, a, a meeting. And that was like my first time in actually pitching an actual venture capital firm, you know. Mm -hmm. I'd raised like, even at, at, at YC, you know, YC is really like a founder friendly environment. So it's not, you know, they're not necessarily even looking for, you know, the, I think YC just looks for like maybe indicators that, oh, this could succeed. It doesn't necessarily mean how you even present yeah. it now. And then, so I'd gone through like this, you know, maybe like three weeks of talking to this, um, um, to, to the guys at Kuzla Ventures. And eventually, um, um, Vinod emailed me and it's like, oh, you know, it's too early for us. Mm. We won't be able to do it. Um, and then I, I took my bag, you know, from San Francisco, moved back to Lagos. And at, at this time, I think this was April, the transactions were growing. And I think like three days later, you know, Vinod emails me and is like, oh, by the way, you know, I changed my mind. If you oh. were going to, you know, if you guys are going to do this, uh, sort of like figuring out this financial inclusion thing, um, I'm happy to invest $500,000. I was on my couch when I saw it. So I was like, interestingly, the dollar was 500 at the time. Ah, I did the math, it was 250 million naira. <laughs> then I called Fellini, I'm like, oh, Vinod is going to write us a $500,000 check. I was like, guy, now, <laughs> stop, stop, <laughs> stop playing with my emotions. And then, so that was like the first time when we felt like, okay, it could make sense for us to focus on the markets where the banks weren't, you know, really tapping into the opportunities. Mm -hmm. And, but then we didn't even make the change immediately. So we went to like, I think like by April, we're already now doing maybe like maybe six, 60, 80,000 dollars a month in transactions, but we're making, you know, we're in generation revenue. As a matter of fact, we're losing money per transaction. Mm. So, cause the our pricing again, I, I guess I had not learned my lesson. <laughs> our pricing didn't make sense um, because bank transfers in Nigeria would typically charge you a flat fee. Yeah. And then if you had to use a payment processor that would first charge like 1.5% on the card, it basically just doesn't work. But then we had one customer that was using the chat bots that typically would almost transfer money like maybe 10 times a day. Mm. And ideally, like the average cost DNA of our customer would probably, best case, transfer money three times a month. Mm. So we will block this guy's account and it will create another Facebook account. As a matter of fact, at some point, he had like five accounts that, they, that were transferring money at the same time. Wow. So we were sure that it was fraud. So we they're basically like blocking his account, he will create a new one, block his account, he will create a new one. And then we then, I think he sent like 100,000. And then we charged this card, but we didn't terminate the money to the destination account that at least I had. He will show up. So then the guy reaches out and says, oh, he wants to, you know, that he sent money, didn't get there. And then we're like, well, you know, there's some KYC that we need to verify. You know, where are you? And then he's like, oh, it's somewhere in Ibeju Leki. And we're like, okay, would you mind coming to our office in Leki phase one then? And then he showed up in, in the office. I remember that I was sitting at our you know, boardroom then with him and I was like, what do you do? And then it was like, he's an agent. And mm. I'm like, what do you mean? It says that, you know, people come to his um, shops to to send money and that he has like five of those stores, mm. which then makes sense that he had like five accounts on the chat box. Um, and then I remembered, I think it was calling me that eventually even then went to him to one of the, the locations. And interestingly, it was in front of a sterling bank, at you know, branch, like people would rather come to him than, than go to the him. bank. Yeah. And then we're trying to understand why. But then one of the things that made sense was that many of these type of customers were probably like busy SMEs. So, you know, mm. think about a store owner that just wants to transfer this money and go. Do, they don't want to go to a bank. You fill this form and then you wait on the queue and stuff. So eventually, so that was like the first, second, you know, collision with sort of like agent banking. And then there was a, the third one was myself and one of my teammates had gone to Abuja to, to talk to some of our friends that were building some electricity payment company. And um, eventually we met someone that said, oh, that they have like this agent network where they, you know, where they sell, where that's how people buy electricity. Mm. And they were like, oh, why are people not, not buying online? We're like, well, yeah, we have an online channel, but 
like bulk of the market still uses yeah. this this agent approach then we went to about so then the, someone gave us like a list of all these agents so many of them were like barbing saloons uh some were like restaurants and then we went to talk to a lot of yeah. them and we saw that they were basically like you know selling electricity vouchers and stuff so and then it was like the time when we were sure that okay we needed to build this thing and i remember i then had a call with Bellini that night i'm like you know by tomorrow we need an app for agents <laughs> and then it's like you know oh we've built the company on a narrative of messaging mm -hmm. and and interestingly the next morning there was an app and then at the hotel i was staying uh, myself and you know one of my colleagues that were in abuja then went to like the business center there so the guy that does like printing and you know it was a sort of like a cyber cafe and then we sold him this idea of you know you can buy a time you can sell data you can do subscriptions and transfers for people on this right, app yeah. and then that was like our first real agent um and also that that was how we, we we eventually pivoted and i think that the interesting data point for us was between november and december almost like one month of just like onboarding maybe about 300 agents on it our volumes literally grew like three x mm. and then for the first time we actually made real money you didn't lose money yeah <laughs> and it was like almost like a profitable month so yeah, yeah that's like this is it we finally yeah. found it yeah we're like yeah this this is it to be honest I, I i i still think that we still didn't right you know just thinking about it now right because I feel like sometimes you could literally sit on so much data, but it's mm. very difficult for founders to make decisions. Because we're still really, we're trying like many experiments. I, I, and I remember that, so maybe like September that year, I had emailed all our seed investors, Kozla, Ventures Platform, everybody. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you know, there's something that YC says, are you default dead or default alive? Mm -hmm. And then the whole idea is that if you would not, so you basically look at your bank balance as a founder and you're like, will I break even, you mm. know, before I run out of money? Right. If the answer is no, you're default dead. Mm. And then, so PG would say, you could bank that investors will bail you out, oh. but what if they don't bail you out? And then you would, it's, it's called the fatal pinch, mm. which is where you just crash and burn. So I emailed all our investors and I was like, we will not eat break even, even before we run out of cash. Like mm. this was September 2017. And interestingly, we like we probably still had like $300,000 in the bank. Mm. But like I was just sure that like on our it's current model, happen. we're going to like run out of cash. And then we started running different experiments. So the agent thing was one of it. We're doing like some online merchant stuff. We're trying to do some cross-border payment stuff. And then January 2018, Dotsun, Olo Poroku, you know Dotson? Starter guy. Yeah. yeah. Dotson came into our office and then I was just talking to him about, you know, all of these things that we're doing. And then he looked at it and I was like, oh, you know, how, how come you're having so much transactions on this thing and then you're not, not focusing on it? Um, and I'm like, I, I don't know. <laughs> I was like, I was like, shut down all the other ones and do this. And then like the next day, we basically like just you know, stop focusing on the merchant stuff, change our dashboard because before we used to have like maybe agent transactions, like transactions from the bots, basically just merge it into one and events essentially. And that was the pivot. Yeah, that was it, yeah. And you guys didn't default. Uh, and we didn't what? You guys didn't default, so you guys got defaulted. How do you say Oh that? okay, default dead. So default dead. Yeah, so we, we didn't run out of cash. No. So what then happened was you know, as the transaction started to grow, um, we started to like generate enough revenues to basically then cover our cost. Mm. And then from there, we basically just kept growing. Um, so I think like late 2018, uh, where we then started to talk to investors around raising the next round of capital. But by that time, we were already profitable. And you're still profitable now? Well, it depends on, <laughs> on what level right so i think that essentially right now we're investing a lot in growth mm. which means that we are funding like a lot of like expansions and stuff mm. right so so uh, on some and, months and yes, that's what you raised no. series a for yes so the whole idea for our series a was to just after we had then figured out that um in the markets that we were there was still like a lot of um 
infrastructure that needed to be built for digital financial services to sort of take off. And the whole idea was agents were going to be th the backbone of that infrastructure. Right. And we needed to build out like a, a really wide big agent network. And uh, so, yeah, we started talk talking to investors to say, oh, we need to raise capital. And then between like November and March 2019, uh, we raised a $5 million Series A from the Patek Africa Fund. And that, that was quite interesting because um, uh, even the, the Patek, you know, just thinking about it now, um, at YC Demo Day, I ran into an investor that eventually didn't, um, didn't invest in the company. But at the time, I had this habit of always sending like monthly investor updates to, mm -hmm. I had a list um, on my Gmail, which would be like, um, I can't remember what the list was, but basically people that, that didn't invest in the company. So one day he reached out to me and I was like, oh, like the numbers look quite impressive. You know, I now work for the Patek fund, mm -hmm. but then we have an African fund. Will you be interested in talking to, to the team? And then interestingly, I think about a month after the Patek Africa team was in Lagos and then they came to our office and then we weren't even fundraising to be honest. We just had the nice chat around <laughs> the market, the opportunities and and then I think that um, they offered us maybe like a check, but we're not raising money, so we're like, uh, you know, no we're not yeah. raising. And then they were like, okay, um, you know, maybe we'll double it or something like that. <laughs> 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 and then, so my son, let me then look at us. <laughs> okay, it might not be bad to fund this. <laughs> and, and then we then had this, you know, it was then like we had figured out the experiment. Mm. It was sort of, okay, how do we then scale this scale business? Or... Yeah, so essentially, that's, that's so what happened. So I, I saw the, the, some of the press releases that went out when you raised the fund, when you announced April 2019, and said that you guys had 4,500 merchants and processing $30 million. I want to know if you can share. What's like, what are your figures like now, like almost three, two years after, or one year and some months? So I, I feel like, you know, the more I sort of stay in this like space and you know financial services generally um, in Nigeria I, I think over time I have come to learn the hard way of necessarily putting out your numbers out there mm. um, I, I think we are still in a in a largely uh, in a market where the regulator isn't really sure mm. of um, of the framework of you know different things and sometimes i think while in bid to position ourselves as you know startups and um basically want to show oh, some form of growth um you also get into like problems with the regulators right. so uh, let me give you an example um so the the framework that probably powers um a business like ours ideally would be a super agent network, you know, licensed, which we are licensed for. And over time, you soon realize that when you engage the regulators, even in the mind of the regulator, they were, they probably don't know that some businesses could be that big, right? Mm. So, you know, so they're probably thinking best case, you will process, you know, a hundred million a month. And then if you show up with like these billions and then they're like, you know, what's, what's going on? So you essentially have to like, um, either get like other licenses or partner with banks and stuff so but just to give it context right now i, I think we have about fifty thousand, um you know merchants or agents on the platform yeah. um i think that for us right now it's sort of figuring out how to do more with the network right mm. uh, which is essentially trying to figure out a way for our merchants or agents to generate more income and then trying to position ourselves as a platform whereby other, you know, s other maybe bill payment companies or businesses that are interested in like disbursing cash or taking payments could definitely leverage the infrastructure we've built. And then it will be win-win for everyone because the agents get to, to get more commissions from that. Right. What would you say is the best thing about what you're currently building at Kodi? The best thing, I, I think that it is the ability to contribute to, you know, what I would call 
you know, the future of the digital economy. So mm. uh, what I mean by that is um, today, even in my streets in Lagos, there are about three or four agents, mm. you know, that are POS agents on, on, on my streets. And I think that one of the things that that does is, first of all, because of that access, you definitely can increase the number of people that are using financial services. Mm. So for context, so imagine that um, someone was um, a gate man, you know, around there, and then maybe his employer would typically have paid him in cash, mm. right? For the average employer around these hacks is, all your money probably is in your bank account. Mm -hmm. The reason why you're only giving th your driver or your gate man cash is because that's the only way you can pay him because he doesn't have a bank account. And banks typically have this look and feel of sophistication, yeah. ideally. So many of these, you know, unbanked people will probably not even want to walk into a bank to open an account. Sure. Uh, and even if you open an account, because the bank might be far away from where you are, um, you, it's not as accessible to, to get your cash out. So, but then now that there are agents everywhere, it's not even just the transaction that is being processed. Mm. It's also the fact that we are literally accelerating the number of people like creating bank accounts, mm. the number of people trying to use their banks. Because sometimes when we look at like data from people that are unbanked, I have seen like traders that generate as much as 500,000 Naira a day in sales mm. that don't use bank accounts. So because I think that sometimes there's a bias that if you don't have an, a bank account, it's yeah, because yeah, you don't have money. Yeah. But I think that at Specific. some point, it's just that if you think about the DNA of the informal market, um, a trader needs to literally open his or her store almost every hour to make money. If I have to close down my store to go to a bank to do a transaction, uh, it could take me like an hour and I would have lost sales. Yeah. And that's what, you know, what could it does? It's the fact that we are literally, you know, increasing the number of people, the number of transactions that can come to, you know, that can become digital. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that that's like the biggest contribution we can make. It's not even that, oh, these transactions were with these banks before. It's yeah. like these transactions didn't exist. Yeah. You know, people were only doing it in cash. Now, a lot of it is now being digitized because there's access to f digital financial services and it's affordable. Would you also say that in some way that's also like one of the key challenges? Yes, I think that um, there's a there's a lot of challenges with you know <laughs> a lot a whole lot you know <laughs> building in this market. I, I think on one end is just um, it's it's an expensive network to build mm. generally because there's there's always like um, a huge investment upfront that you have to be put into being able to sign up an agent, set up an agent, train an agent, all of that, you know, it's an investment you have to make up front. And then it could take you a while to, to break even on that. Um, and then I also think, also understanding the fact that even many of these locations at some point might become unviable mm. because um, if you're sort of like scaling, there will probably be like a lack of efficiency in what you're building. And mm. then you could eventually realize that maybe 20% of the network that you, you're building because they are SMEs to her and all of that. So if they are not making enough money, they're gonna shut down at some point and all of that. So it's on one end, being able to be so mathematical about how you build this network mm. for profitability of the agents first, first, because if the agent isn't profitable, it doesn't matter how much volumes you're processing yeah. today, that person is gonna go out of business. So I think that, that that's the hard part, it's like, sort of investing and scaling, but at the same time trying to make sure that, you know, you are tactical about it. Mm. Yeah, that, that's challenging. Mm, interesting. So you've had a very interesting journey, right? Like the business is from um, doing entrepreneurship and re residence and VGG to like doing your two health business. Yes. Very interesting. I always ask like, why health health at the same time? And then goes straight into financial finance, services. Uh, financial services and then losing one business and then doing another one, right? And this this one started as a different idea. Yeah. So it's like, there are some founders that are lucky. They just like get the idea and just goes all the way and that's what they're pursuing. Yeah. But you've had like, you had to try and experiment a lot. Would you say this, if, if you had to do this all over again and say God comes and say, no, it's clean slate. Okay. You come back, you get to this point too, but. Okay. 
you have the opportunity to now go back in time and change okay. stuff. Is there anything about your journey that you say, you know what, I'm not doing this. Let me just go to what I know and work. Or you're just going right. to be like, everything was worth experiencing. Is it, what's your perspective? So I, I think that um, maybe the, the only thing I would have probably changed or maybe not changed was I would have probably tried a, a real job for like a year or two. Oh yeah? Why? Yes. Uh, I think that um, if you're a founder like me, which pretty much, you know, you have like zero experience, maybe working for people mm. or managing people, um, there are just a lot of things that take, takes you a while to, to really understand, um, mm. especially with like managing people, right. building a team. Um, Kudi is like 120 people now. So that meant like- Employees full-time employee yes wow. yes and so that means like there's a lot of like learning on the job mm. and then sometimes when I'm talking to a few of my founder friends and I'm like oh you know I have this problem that I'm dealing with and then this person like oh what you know why don't you do this why don't you do that and then I realized that s sometimes um, I don't necessarily think that you need a work experience to be a successful founder mm -hmm. I don't think so but I Obviously. think that <laughs> but I think that it gives you a bit of, you know, perspective, um, working with people, um, understanding people, even understanding how to like manage, you know, people that are like your, your boss or, yeah. you know, people that report to you. Um, I think that just not having the few things that have taken me a while to, to learn, um, especially like around like building a team, yeah. right, which I felt like maybe if i had worked in like a you know maybe like a structured environment for a while i would have at least seen some structure and then mm. that would make me understand how to like better position you know my team for for where we're going to but if i think about all of like my different like successes or failures or whatever i don't think i would have changed any i think that all of those things you know make me who i yeah, am now yeah. And then each of those experiences, you know, have have had like their impact on me, the good, the bad, you know, the ugly. And you know, even for all of the mistakes that I have made, it's just given me a better perspective. There are things that I can't change, mm. but means that like going forward, you know, there's a way that you know I would approach life. Yeah. I have two follow-up questions there. Okay. First one would be, so you said you made some hiring people management mistakes, right? I want to know what. What is the most significant hiring of people mistake you've made? <laughs> and then two, you also said you've had plenty of successes and failures. What, which of them is your favorite failure experience and why? Hmm. So, so people, um, so I think that your organization or your startup or, you know, there was a day that I had, I put a tweet out and many people were in my DM like, shouting and abusing me oh and, yeah, was and the whole idea was that I said the the biggest challenge to scaling a fintech is talent um, that it's not capital mm. and then you know a lot of people were like oh you know but you need to raise capital to be able to attract talent and I, and I agree I think it's a chicken and egg problem now I think the challenge when I think about just building teams is um, sometimes there's a when you're hiring hiring is like the especially at the early days it's mm. like the the soul of the company you mm. know you kind of have to get it right at hiring because if you don't um, many things can go can go wrong so and i also think that there's a there's the ability to not necessarily um how do i put this so i think sometimes if you do not structure your startup in you, so let me give you an example. Um, I could start a company today and, uh, you know, let's say we're co-founders, right? And then we hired, you know, a certain sum mm. for, um, let's say, product, right? And in six months in, we make some VP of product. Mm. Um, the question really is, is some VP of product mm. or is VP of product at Kudi. And then there are different types of, mm. you know, team members. 
there are people that even though we've given Sam VP of product, he can actually become VP of product. He can scale as the company scales, mm -hmm. right? There are scenarios in which he just can't because, yeah. you know, either, and I think it's largely the support they get, you know, maybe from the founders, also that inner drive to become that. Yeah. Now, essentially, what could then happen is that you could destroy Sam's career or your relationship with Sam if you're mm. not careful because maybe eventually, you know, product is not working, everybody's complaining, the customers are disgruntled, and now you have to hire VP of product, mm. right? Then do you then demote Sam from VP of product to product lead? So I think that the, I wouldn't say like the biggest mistake or the I feel like one of the hardest lessons that I have learned in starting a company is being careful with titles mm. um, because I think that you could lose like a lot of time you know managing people's emotions and not being able to get the work done if you give out the wrong titles and then you know I, I remember having this conversation with Shola of Paystack back sense. then and then you know Shola would typically tell me that uh, the truth is sometimes you don't know who is you know, head of support or head of sales or whatever, right? But you know that you have like people that are passionate about it, yeah. you know. And sometimes as the company scales, you get to really understand, you know, what you what you need per role. So I think that the sort of like the biggest pain point for me, you know, in the past when I think about mistakes that I've made, you know, with people is, I think sometimes it's just handling them titles that eventually you have to make changes but they wouldn't really understand why you have to make those changes. And then that can really have a negative impact on your relationships with them. That's very interesting, because when I was having this conversation with Ezra, Shola's co-founder, he said that one of the mistakes that they have made was that they made engineers engineering managers before they were engineering managers. Yeah. And so they realized after six months that, shoot, we just made a huge mistake. And they had to take them back to engineers yeah. and they hire new engineering managers. Yeah. I think that largely because of maybe like the nature of engineers, they probably will survive that. Mm. But ideally, most people would, would struggle with it yeah. um, because if you have to, because again, an engineer could still spend his time writing code, even yeah. if he's a manager. But imagine you've made someone, you know, maybe like a finance lead, right? When this person is maybe like an accountant. Mm -hmm. Eventually, when you hire, you know, someone to add finance, then they have to like, reports to this person so if you're not careful um it could take a while for you to to eventually make that change and and if you also just do it in a very like you don't give a shit type of way you're going to like ruin your relationship with them and the truth is that there's no right or wrong you just have to know that your actions have consequences and you know you have to be fine with it i ask this question a lot because successes are great right but sometimes a lot of times when you fail at something it's it changes you, yeah. right? It's, it ends up becoming something that you have to reference, good, bad, right? And for some people, they've had plenty. <laughs> okay. For more of other people, just one or two, but you end up seeing that, I failed at that thing and it became like such a pivotal moment in my life that I'm even grateful in hindsight that okay. it was something I went through. Okay, so I, I think it was um, my last company before, you know, I started working on Kudi, okay. um, or on Kudi, I think that I'm grateful for the experience um, to have been able to build, you know, that the company at the time. I think by the time I left, we were probably about 15, 16 mm. people. Um, we had built some real value. But that whole experience with managing, um, you know, disagreements with your co-founders, disagreement with investors, um, expectation of people. I think it, sh it shaped me a lot. Um, right. So whereby right now, um, in like the last four years of, you know, building Kudi out, myself and Kweluni, I think we have like a very decent conflict management, mm. you know, approach because I think that one of the biggest things that can kill a startup is co-founder disputes. Yeah. Um, and then I remembered as at YC there was like this sort of therapy session where you know they will bring you and your co-founder together and then sort of trying to get like perspective you know how you will manage issues 
And I think that just coming from, just understanding that you have to communicate. I have to always communicate. We don't even have to agree on this yeah. thing, but you need to know my position. I need to know your position. And then I think that that has helped a lot. And then also like managing shareholders, investors, expectations. You know, I have learned over time that um, you have to like be very careful about how you pick your investors. So ideally, um, so leaving my former startup, for example, I wouldn't go into like a competition to 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 win a check from someone, yeah. you know, no matter how, how how bad I needed the money, because I soon realized that co-founder relationships are great, but like I think the, the one with the investors is even like if someone is on your cap table, um, they are not going anywhere anytime mm. soon, right? Um, even and you can't even like say, oh, here's your money back with some interest, like you need their consent. So you have to be like extremely careful about who you pick as an investor and then make sure that you know you can you're happy to like go like five, ten years with having okay. this on board. So many of our investors in Kudit today are people that, you know, I have spent a lot of time building relationships with right. and then also just like communicating, you know, whether whether good, bad, ugly, like when there's a problem, for example, um, like immediately there's a big problem. I shoot my investors an email like you know, because I feel like sometimes founders, you know, put too much pressure on their, their, their selves, you know, thinking that you have to solve all problems. Yeah. And the truth is that there are problems that ideally you could say all the problems are it's your fault, you know. Mm. People could say, oh, couldn't you have seen that? You know, couldn't you have adjusted this? But the truth is that you're going to make mistakes. Um, it's in like i say in like 10 years of building a company i think that there will probably be like four or five times that you would even think that you're still going to die as a business <laughs> so i think you need like a lot of support and then you need investors that can understand that and i think the the first way to tackling that problem is just communicating because if a problem happens before i even think of a solution if i think that this is an existential threat I would shoot my investors an email and be like, okay, I'm thinking about this, but hey, we can as well think about it together. So I think that from all of the experience I had there, not really maybe like the relationship that went bad and just thinking about, you know, the road ahead, I'm very deliberate about how I build relationships going forward. I try to be as, you know, transparent as I can be, but also just understand that like, Think many things are not personal, it's just business. And if it doesn't work out, that's fine. <laughs> Relationships have, have, don't have to be ruined. So I would say that like my, sort of my biggest mistake that has also shaped me was the fact that, you know, I resigned from my last company. Um, I think that it was a difficult period actually. Uh, it was like, I think I spent um, maybe about th three months just almost in like a dark place, mm -hmm. you know, in my life and just, just trying to figure out what to do. But I think that that has also shown me that anything is possible. Yeah. Um, and even if I have problems thrown at me in future, I can always take a step back and then you know, give sure. it another shot. What's the exit plan in this era of acquisition now? Oh. Are you looking like <laughs> we're going to do 10 years an IPO? Or like, hey guys, in case you want to bring some a huge amount of dollars, we might really. So I, I think that um, for me, though, um, I can't say for Prelim. <laughs> <laughs> for me, I, I think that, and I'm, I'm being sincere about this, I, I think I am largely motivated by the kind of change that mm. a business like Kudi can, can make can in make. Nigeria, the kind of impact you know, it can make. And you know, looking forward to like a couple of months, being able to like almost go everywhere in Nigeria and say, oh, that's a Kudi agent, that's okay. a Kudi agent. And I think the way I think about it is this. Can I drive this vision by myself um, over the next 10 years or five years and achieve the results and make this thing possible? Or is there someone that is equipped to help me drive it faster? Mm. So if, for example, um, for Kudi to, let's say, get to maybe 300,000 agents in Nigeria, for example, it could take maybe another 24 months, you know, a lot more venture capital to get there, a lot more experimentation and all of that to get there. And let's say, hypothetically, there's someone that is equipped 
to literally make that change happen in like six months, then that's an acquisition that is worth talking that's about. Right. Because I think at the end of the day, um, while of course in a liquidity event, investors get paid, shareholders, employees that have stock options, founders, you know, everybody <laughs> makes money and all of that. You know, I, I think that it would suck for you to like, let's say you sold your company today and you made like say thirty million dollars or whatever, and then your acquirer shuts it down tomorrow. Mm. You know, it will I, I feel like money's not gonna feel the emptiness yeah. you will feel. So for me, it's more of uh, while of course the, the exit <laughs> is important for all shareholders, but I think that it's also the fact that can this person or can this, this entity change. drive this change faster and better than me? And I think that it sometimes you know founders always feel like you can do anything you can. But the truth is that there are people that I have spoken to in my you know in there are corporates that I have spoken to in the past that I know that these people can probably drive you know this a lot faster than we can because of like there are dependencies or like levers that we have to like almost build yeah. for us to be able to make some things happen, which could be like a, at the tip of a finger of someone. But just trying to be sure that, you know, that person is committed to it. And if that can happen, yeah, we Why wouldn't not? mind. What's your favorite city in the world? City, um, he would be Casablanca. What's your wildest dream? That has nothing to do with coding. So I think that entrepreneurship is an instrument to drive social change mm -hmm. um, or economic change in somewhere like Nigeria, for example. And I remember at the, uh, there was a particular New Year event that I had in my house with a couple of friends and we we're talking about what we all wanted to do in like, you know, the last next five, six years. And I was talking about the fact that, so this was even before like, you know, um, I was, and I was talking about being able to sort of like drive change in like Nigerian police force. You know, this was like two years ago. Mm -hmm. And I was saying to a friend that, you know, until the day if um, I finish from school as a software engineer and I'm, uh, I'm interested in working for the Nigerian police force, um, until that day happens, um, we're still not gonna see the kind of change that we're looking for mm -hmm. because it's the quality of people and the quality of life that you have there. And I'd always just be motivated by the fact that that's something I would sort of be interested in, sort of would be like public office ah. at some point, maybe not like from a ministerial <laughs> type stuff, you know, maybe like someone is a minister there and I, I wouldn't say it's like my wildest dream. It would sort of just be like something, something that I am that passionate about, to. whereby I could just try like support this person and then trying to figure out how we can position some national like, I don't want to use the word infrastructure, national, <laughs> you know, pillar of the country in a way whereby we can, we can make Nigeria a better place. I know that sounds political, but I think that at the end of the day for many of us, um, all of the businesses that we're building in for fa many founders, it's sort of because of a change you want to see. Yeah. And I think that we need to largely drive up, um, drive up the quality of life in, in our country because the, our success is really dependent on the macros, yeah. uh, you know, the economy, state of the security and everything here. And then that I would just at some point be, be interested in being able to, to give back in a form of um, a public office type of thing. Yeah. Interesting. Something like that. When you're not working, what do you do? I'm sleeping. <laughs> 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 you like to sleep? Yeah, I think I, yeah, I, I don't get enough sleep. Uh -huh. Not because I'm working oh. all the time, but I think I always like struggle with sleeping. So if I can get enough time to sleep. As um, much as you can. Yeah. I don't like to go out too much. So I just want to be in my house and sleep. Um, maybe watch Netflix and chill. <laughs> and chill. Interesting. Yeah. Question I always ask, because I like to know the kind of people that I have interviewed. You may prefer serial or serial after me. Choose wisely, please. Think about it. Milk before cereal. 
executive decisions what you're about to make. So the way I, d I would make it is a bit different. I will put cereal in a cup mm -hmm. and I'll put milk in a cup. Okay. Which one do you pour first? Which one do I pour first? Of course, it's the milk now. You pour the milk on the, ah. on the cereal. Thank you. I Wait, did you say you pour the milk on the cereal? Yes. I take I take <laughs> <it>. <laughs> I, I think that you didn't get what I was saying. I take it back. Yeah, I, take, I take be that. Be I because I take it because back. you have no, to like feel no. the... No. Yeah. Why so do you guys, why, why do they keep saying this? Like, no. So you, you the put change this I want to cause cereal in, in milk. This, in, this, in this nation, the social change is for people to begin to put milk. Like you're cereal. putting Gary in, in, in water. Is water no, in Gary? Is that no, 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 no. <laughs> How about no. you say water um, and We're Gary? done. Thank you so much for watching, guys. What's, your, what's the advice you would give to first time founders? It's very short, very. Just do it. Just do it. Yeah. I thought you say they should get experience since you wish you had no experience. No, I, I don't think um, it matters. I think no one really, my theory is no one really knows what they are doing. Mm. Most people are winging it. True. And as uh, Steve Jobs would say, um, most of the biggest changes you've seen in the world are built by people not necessarily smarter than you are. I enough. think it's just the the ability to just take that risk. So I think that like you you don't know whether it's going to succeed or not. So sure. and there's nothing you can do. Like no one wants saw the pandemic. Yeah. Right. So just just do it. Just do it guys. That's the final word that Yinka has for us. Uh, thank you so much for staying to this video. It was a very interesting conversation. To be honest, I didn't think you were going to talk this much. Because uh. it was just like, okay, maybe we'll do like 15 minutes. But then you just <laughs> kept. And that was really good. Thank you so much for opening up. It was very interesting to learn about your journey. Thanks uh, for having me. Thank you so much. If you want this video to the end, like I always say, you are the real MVP. So thank you so much for staying to the end. Please share this video, comment, ask your questions, share, share, most importantly. But then again, make sure that you don't leave this channel without clicking on the subscription button below so that I can have the ginger to bring more awesome people like Yinka to this YouTube channel. But hey, see you guys in another video. Peace out.